I typically um, talk to you all about head injuries. <clears throat> so I'm used to giving this in person, and I guess you guys are used to listening in person. So I can't be as animated or um, ask questions uh, to people who are falling asleep like I usually do. So I will just run through the slides. Um, you know, there's, there's closed head injury and there's um, open head injury. Uh, I'm not gonna really differentiate between the two. Um, you know, there's kids who whack their heads and have a problem and then there's kids who get bitten by a dog or God forbid, are shot or have some sort of penetrating injury. Um, I'll, I'll address that very briefly, but I'll, we'll talk about head injury just in general. So, uh, head injury is pretty common in the United States, as you know, um, in children uh, throughout the world. But in the United States, these are these are the numbers. These numbers are a little old; they're probably about eight years old, nine years old. <clears throat> but um, uh, the major cause of death in children in in this country is from trauma more than leukemia or anything else. Um, and uh, we'll talk about helmets and cars and things like that in a moment. But the problem with that, you know, if, if somebody dies from a head injury, that's one thing. But most kids don't die from head injuries. But they can be left with a lot of problems. Um, and this would include kids with non-accidental trauma, you know, shaken babies, which unfortunately we see a fair amount of. Um, you know, during this time when there's economic stress and COVID and other stressors in people's lives, you we see sometimes an uptick in these non-accidental traumas. Things at home are a little um, anxious, and there's uh, high levels of anxiety and stress, and and sometimes the little kids are take the brunt of that. There are things that have helped a lot, particularly uh, helmets, seat belts. Um, of course, little kids probably shouldn't be in a front seat so that uh, an airbag would help them, but all these uh, preventative measures have certainly helped decrease the, the rate of what I used to see when I was a resident, which was much higher back then. That was a long time ago. Um, the majority of head injuries are just head bumps. So for any of you that have worked in the emergency room or rotated the emergency room, you know, we see a lot of kids, babies who are dropped or fell or their, you know, their sibling whacked them in the head. So most, most head injuries um, in kids are mild head injuries, as opposed to, say, adults. Uh, you know, a lot of head injuries in adults are from motor vehicle accidents and things like that. You don't see a lot of motor vehicle accident trauma in kids, but we'll talk about that as well. Um, severe head injuries are the bad ones. Um, but again, the, um, the number of kids that die from severe head injuries is much smaller than adults. Then again, most adults come in and from high-speed motor vehicle accidents or falling long distances. So intuitively, they're probably gonna have more fatal injuries than children do. But kids are pretty resilient. Even kids who've had really bad head injuries um, where an adult may not have tolerated that kind of trauma, a, a child would. The, pro the downside of that is when they survive, they survive with problems, with deficits. And about 10% of kids have moderate head injuries. Those are the kids that come in the hospital after a skateboard accident or something like that and are um, agitated or um, go in and out of consciousness. And um, they, they tend to do pretty well, but need to be watched very carefully. Um, assessing a head injury. So, you know, figuring out whether it's mild to severe or moderate um, requires um, an examination and sometimes examining babies isn't that easy. If you've been around for as long as I have, you can pretty much look at a, a baby and tell if they if they're in bad shape or not. Uh, most babies are either awake and alert and crying or looking at you or they're not. Um, the adult patient's a little um, more, um, an exam is a, is a lot easier. Either they can follow uh, an exam or uh, follow a command or they can't. They can either open their eyes or they can't. So um, in that regard, the way that we typically grade head injuries is based on the Glasgow Coma Score, which I'm sure all of you are at least vaguely familiar with. 
So <clears throat> just to be clear, anybody who's worked with neurosurgery patients or neurology patients, particularly in the ICU, um, we use a GCS as a, as a measure for almost any neuro, neuro patient. When the Glasgow Coma Score was really established strictly for head injury, not for subarachnoid hemorrhage, not for brain tumors, not for hydrocephalus, not for seizure disorders, or kids with demyelinating disease or infections. But we use the Glasgow Coma Score to give an indication of how, um, of what a kid's neurologic status is for everything. Um, but it wasn't established for everything. It was established for head injuries. But nowadays, you know, if a kid comes in uh, with a posterior fossa tumor and hydrocephalus and they're comatose, somebody will say, well, they're a GCS of six. It's really not a Glasgow coma score because the kid doesn't have a head injury, but it gives you an indication the kid's pretty sick and they're not waking up. So um, I would ask if there was an audience, I would ask you guys if you know which of the three um, components of the Glasgow coma scale um, are most indicative uh, of outcome. Which, which one, a motor score, verbal score, eye score, which one is going to be the most predictive of how somebody's going to do? And since I can't ask you, I'll tell you. Um, it's the motor score. The higher your motor score, the better you're going to do. Verbal scores, particularly in children, are not very um, confident, and eye scores for sure, particularly in a toddler. They may not open their eyes because they just don't want to. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you can sort of figure that out by trying to pry their eyes open. Because if they squint and close their eyes against you, you're pretty sure that's a behavioral issue. But if a baby, if a four-month-old comes in and they're not opening their eyes, that's a problem. Um, in an older patient <clears throat> where you might want to or can elicit a little bit of pain, things have changed, how we elicit pain. But, you know, um, we used to pinch the trap here or do a fairly start hard sternal rub or put our reflex hammer on the, on the fingernail and sque squeeze it, you can elicit a lot of pain pretty fast, pretty hard to see, you know, if somebody's not opening their eyes and you give them a little pain and they look at you or they curse at you, you know that they can open their eyes okay. So in an adult, <clears throat> you know, the, the motor score has a lot to do, essentially it mimics the, the brain. If you can obey commands, if you ask somebody to stick out their tongue or show three fingers, uh, and incidentally, just because you, um, you know, if you ask somebody to, um, to do something and, and they don't do it, um, it doesn't mean that they can't. So you need to make sure that they're, they don't have a bunch of narcotics on board or the temperature is at 93 or something like that. So all, all of these scores are very dependent on the on somebody not having a metabolic issue or being too cold or having drugs on board. You know, if they've been given, you know, Valium and uh, Dilantin because they were, they had a post, you know, post-traumatic seizure, this, this motor exam may not be very reliable. <clears throat> so if you can obey commands, your brain's working pretty well. Your higher cortical function is good. If you don't obey commands, but you localize the pain, and again, localizing means you give somebody a painful stimulus and they will try to swat it away. <clears throat> and somebody who's had, say, a left arm fracture and they can't move their left arm and you pinch them over on their left side and they cross, cross their body, they cross midline to get to you, or you pinch their knee or their leg and they reach down to their leg, that's localizing, as opposed to withdrawing. Some separate, you know, distinguishing between the two isn't always that easy. Uh, if they would withdraw the pain, they usually just flail their arms around, regardless of where their pain is. You can push their endotracheal tube in, and, um, you know, if they try to grab the tube, that's localizing. If they're otherwise just flailing around, they're probably withdrawing. Flexing the pain, you know, is, is typically flexing their arms. <clears throat> they won't extend and they won't flail. Extending the pain, which is what people think of as the cerebral posturing. You can't see my arms, but essentially, you know, the arms are down by the side and the hand fists are clenched. When, when, you have, when you have that on exam, your, your brain probably isn't working all the way down to the level of the, of the pons. You know, obeys commands, cortical function. Localized to pain, your thalamus probably works. 
withdraws the pain, you're probably down at the midbrain, flexes the pain, you're down at the pons, and extends the pain, you're getting pretty near the medulla. And no response is, you know, you'd be concerned that that patient is very close to, if not brain dead. Of course, if you come in obeying command, you're going to do really well. If you come in extending the pain, you may not do so well. Um, the motor score in kids is very similar. You can't ask them to do something, but you can see if they move spontaneously without touching them or eliciting pain or doing anything. And the rest of the motor score is the same as adults. Um, the verbal score in adults is also easy if they're not stoned or drunk or, um, or cold. Um, make sure also that they don't have um, uh, an issue that keeps them from, from speaking. Um, they may nod their head because they've bitten their tongue or something like that. So take all these things into account. Uh, verbal score in kids is much more difficult, uh, particularly in babies. Um, uh, crying in a baby is good. Smiling in a baby is better. But again, just because they're not smiling, it may be because they're, they're in pain or they have a fracture. This unfortunately tends to be the case with kids who've had non-accidental trauma. Um, they may have fractures that you're not, uh, not aware of. Um, the eye-opening exam, again, um, is not great, particularly in kids. Um, they may be closing their eyes because they just, or even an obstinate adult. They, they do exist. Um, <clears throat> so typically we grade, I, at the very beginning, I said severe head injuries. We don't see a lot in kids. You see a lot of in adults, and we see a lot of mild head injuries in kids. So Glasgow Coma Skip scores of 13 to 15 for mild, 9 to 12. And essentially, if you're not following commands, that is a severe head injury. And these are the kids that worry us the most. These are the kids that could die on you. These are the kids that usually have mass lesions in their brain that you actually need a neurosurgeon for. So <clears throat> I'm a surgeon, so I'd like to address some surgical issues. Um, the ones that you would see the most, that we see most commonly. Um, hemorrhages in the brain and then in kids who have swelling with no hemorrhage. Um, this is important. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. So the, I, I'd like to just show you some, some imaging studies first. So you, I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen CAT scans and or MRIs in, in some point in your experience or your training. Um, so a normal CT scan is important to understand so you know what an abnormal one looks like. So CT scans and, and, um, and MRIs are all based sort of on the same principle, and that is that the front of the, the top of the scan is the front of the head and the back is the back of the head. Um, the right side of your screen is the left side of the body, and the left side of the screen is the right side of the body. So this is a scan through the head, fairly low. All the white stuff you see is bone, and all the gray stuff you see is the brain. You can see these kids' ears. You're just clipping the ears. So that's about how far down the scan is. <clears throat> if you move a little bit higher, um, you start to see things a little more clearly. Uh, brain. This is actually the pons. This is the brainstem. You can see the third cranial nerves coming out of the brainstem. Um, all the gray stuff that you see is spinal fluid. So this is the spinal fluid in the fourth ventricle. Um, this is the spinal fluid in the sylvian fissures. And this is the spinal fluid in front of the brainstem. This is a little higher. You can see all this CSF quite well. These are the temporal lobes. When you hear the term herniation or uncle herniation, the uncus is this part of the temporal lobe right here. So that means that if the pressure in the, high, in the brain is high enough, the temporal lobes will start to squeeze in in this direction and make this spinal fluid go away. So the basal cisterns the cisterns at the base of the brain start to disappear, and that would be bad. That's an indication of a swollen brain and increased intracranial pressure. This is yet higher. These, um, this is above the level of the eyes. These are the lateral ventricles. This is the third ventricle, and this is the uh, what we'll call the paramesencephalic cistern. So this is a little smiley face. If you can see the smiley face on the CT scan, the brain's not very tight. If this thing goes away, that means the brain's full enough and tight enough to squeeze the CSF out, and you're looking for trouble. 
So that's uh, the only reason I showed you that is so you have an idea of what a normal CT looks like. So epidural hematomas are um, hemorrhages that are between the skull and the dura. So if you look at the head, there's the scalp, then there's the bone, the skull, then there's the covering of the brain, it's called the dura, and then there's the brain. So an epidural hematoma is outside the dura underneath the skull. So these things actually don't touch the brain, but they push the dura against the brain. Um, these things worry us because they're usually from arterial bleeders. Usually a skull fracture is torn a little artery that travels to the brain, and these things pump blood pretty fast. So if a kid comes in with a head injury and epidural hematoma, and their, their injury is pretty, I apologize, you, the noise that you hear is a helicopter, um, which is right outside my window, going down to the landing pad at the Washington Hospital Center. So forgive me for that. But anyway, um, epidural hematomas, a kid can come with an epidural um, after an injury, and a couple hours later, it can grow pretty big. So the classic presentation is a kid who hits their head, may or may not pass out, looks a little goofy, and then looks pretty good. They have this lucid interval where they look very good. This is a kid who comes in the emergency room with this history. They look pretty good. Somebody tucks them in the back room, and they come back two or three hours later, and the kid's blown a pupil because in the interval, the epidural's grown so big, it's killed them. This is what happened to, uh, to um, Liam Neeson's um, wife, Natasha, I forgot her last name, Richardson. They were skiing, she fell, she hit her head, she passed out, she woke up, she looked fine, they wanted to take her to medical attention, she refused, she had an epidural. Then she crashed and burned, by the time they got a helicopter there, she was almost dead, she died. So um, when we see a kid with an epidural hematoma who's had an injury within say four to six hours, we almost always re-image them. And that's indeed if they don't have to go to the operating room in the first place. We re-image them to make sure that the epidural hasn't grown. So here is um, a classic epidural. <clears throat> this is the skull, this is the brain, and this uh, over here and the left part of the brain is an epidural hematoma. And so how do I know it's epidural? Well, there seems to be an edge to it from here to here. Subdural hematomas are quite broad. These things usually stop at the sutures. There's a coronal suture here and a sagittal suture here, and the dura tends to be stuck there. So the dura gets peeled away from the skull until you get to the sutures and then it stops. And it has this lens type appearance. You can almost imagine that there's a lining to the skull, a lining to the brain that's getting pushed in. Subdural hematomas are not arterial, they're usually venous. Uh, veins are torn away from the superior sagittal sinus and they bleed, and they bleed slowly. But there is no suture, cranial suture, to keep the dura in place. This is all underneath the dura, so the blood just covers the whole brain. So you can see a, a subdural that looks pretty thin, but because it covers the whole side of the head, it's huge in its volume. And they, they're on the brain, they irritate the brain, they make the brain pretty angry. So this is a subdural hematoma. Here's the blood. You can't tell on this picture, but it goes all the way to the midline here and goes all the way back to here. And this is just one slice. If you, know, if you took multiple slices all the way from the top to the bottom, volumetrically, this thing is huge. And you can see this line, these white lines. These, these are the midline of the brain, of the fox, and they're shoved way over. The right side to left side shift that you see here is enormous because of this subdural hematoma. So this is um, sur a picture from surgery. This is, uh, the image I just showed you was a right subdural. This is actually a left subdural. Uh, the bone has been removed. Uh, this is the edge of the bone. This is the dura. And I can tell you um, that the brain is sort of pale in color, maybe a little whitish, palish in color, um, and is very soft. This blue that you see is all blood. I mean, it's blue because it's not oxygenated, it's subdural blood. Um, and you can see the little lumps and bumps in the dura because the brain is trying to get out. The brain, the, the, this is a really, really tight skull. So this is the dura opened, and this brain, obviously the brain shouldn't look like this. 
you can't tell in this picture because it's only two dimensions, but this brain is like three centimeters outside the skull. It's just swelling out. As a matter of fact, it's all we could do to just close this kid's scalp to get him off, get him off the table before he died. So this is what subdurals do. They make the, this incidentally, this is blood in the subarachnoid space. They make the brain pretty angry and are much worse than epidurals in that regard. So intracerebral hemorrhages are literally bleeds in the brain, in the substance of the brain. They're you oftentimes start off with contusions. It, imagine if you get you know punched in the arm, you know, your arm may turn blue and then starts to turn yellow as the blood starts to change in color. The same thing happens to the brain, but the brain is really sensitive. If you hit the brain, um, it may bruise and then it'll start to bleed later on. These, blue, these bruises can blossom. Um, contra coup injuries are when kids hit their, typically hit the back of their head. They whack it pretty hard, like falling off of something or like a skateboard. And the brain um, moves in the, in the inside the head it sort of snaps back and then snaps back forward and the bottom of the skull in the front has got a lot of ridges in it and it injures the brain. So they may hit the back of their head, but injure the front of their brain. That's why it's called the contracule injury. These kids need to be watched very carefully. Even if a neurological exam doesn't change, you need to get serial scans to make sure they're not getting into trouble. So Cindy's probably tired of seeing this picture, but I, I and, and it's an old picture. It's a kid I cared for a long time ago. But it's a really classic example of a contra coup injury. So this kid fell off the back of a pickup truck and hit the back of his head. You can see a little bit of swelling in the scalp here and a little bit of blood in the occipital lobe. But look at his front lobes. They look really bad. So he didn't hit the front of his head. He hit the back of his head. But he's got this, essentially this contusion, this bruise in his brain. And he's got a little bit in the other frontal lobe as well. So uh, one of my partner, he came in when one of my partners was on call and the kid was comatose. His brain looked like this. So he went in and he essentially sucked out this brain. This brain was injured, it was contused. This is not taking out good brain. This is taking out already injured brain. You can see here, this actually looks pretty good. There's a little cleft here where the brain on either side uh, that's left looks pretty good. However, the brain on his left side has now blossomed into this. Um, so I, um, unfortunately had to go in and take out this because he, he had an ICP monitor, uh, which we'll talk about briefly. His pressures were really high. The last thing you want to do to anybody, head injury or otherwise, is mess with both frontal lobes. He had already done this. You know, if you injure both frontal lobes, it's bad. That's what they used to do to people back in the 50s and 60s to um, make them sedate, right? They injure both front lobes. They either take them out or make cuts across them, do lobotomies or lobectomies to sedate them. And that's what this kid's like. After a bilateral front lobe injury, um, he's, he's pretty wrecked. He's alive, but he's wrecked. But the reason I show you this picture is to show you how a contusion can go from this to this. It'll blossom. So a little bit about skull fractures. This kid got hit by a bus. Um, and you can see the left side of his brain over here. There's a little bit of subarachnoid blood in the brain. Um, and interestingly enough, despite this bit of swelling in his temporal lobe, the brain is still in the midline. Maybe the left ventricle is a little squished compared to the right. But the reason I showed this is to show you, this is the same picture, but just the bone image. You can see all these broken bones and you can see how they're shoved out. Usually with a skull fracture, whatever hits them shoves the bone into the brain. All of his bone is getting shoved out and that's because his brain is swelling and pushing them out. And that's why he doesn't have much midline shift. He's trying to protect himself. Unfortunately, this is a dominant temporal lobe. He's right-handed, so this is the left temporal lobe. This left him aphasic, this injury. His, um, his speech was really hindered. Although I operated on him when he was about 12. By the time he was 18 or so, he was actually quite functional. He did, he did remarkably well. His mom, he didn't come back, for, he didn't come home. Um, and his mom went looking for him and she saw a big uh, metro bus and she saw his bike underneath the wheel. That's how she found him. Bad story. So this is sort of a classic um, mild head injury. 
This is a baby who fell off a changing table, normal CAT scan, but you see this crack right here? Linear skull fracture. We see these almost every day. These kids invariably do well. These fractures heal on their own. The brain usually looks fine. We don't need to intervene. This is uh, open depressed skull fracture. So um, the kid that I showed you before that got hit by the bus, there was no lacerations in his scalp. His scalp was bruised. This kid here had a big laceration. This kid um, flew off of a ATV um, and hit his head on the little latch that is on a, a trailer hitch. It was sticking straight up and it went right through his skull and shoved his skull right into his brain. So that's obviously a very dirty injury. Uh, the scalp is open, the skull is open, the dura is open, the brain is exposed. So it's very important that you get all this bone out, you clean up the brain and you close up. He did remarkably well despite being stupid enough to do what he did. This kid came in about three weeks ago. Um, I don't know if any of you took care of him in the ICU. He had six open depressed skull fractures. Um, this is um, a dog bite injury. This is, uh, oh, this is the family dog. Um, I'm not casting aspersions regarding dogs. I love dogs. But this was a, a mixed um, lab pit bull family dog who got this kid in his jaws and the mom uh, had to pry the head out. And I, I, I can't tell you, I, I, um, if I recall correctly, there's a fracture here, fracture here, fracture here, fracture here, and fracture here. So we, and, and all of those went all the way through the skull. One of them went through the dura. And dog bites are very dirty, so we had to, you know, open this up and repair all the fractures. That was quite easy, but we had to wash out the brain and close the dura. Um, so open depressed skull fractures need to be fixed because the air in the skin is exposed to the brain by definition, and you need to close that because the chance for infection is very high. A closed depressed skull fracture, I think I have that next. No, this is another kid. Look at this kid's head, he, this, this skull. It's just shoved right into the brain. This is the edge of the bone. This kid needed to have this fixed because the brain is getting squashed. Um, this is um, that same kid. This is a depressed, but open, uh, depressed closed fracture. This kid did not have a scalp injury. Um, we see babies with these from forceps deliveries, and oftentimes we do not operate on them. Because in a baby, the skull is very malleable. The brain has a lot of growing to do. And the brain, in its growth, usually pops these out without doing an operation. This child is much older. I, I don't remember how old this kid is. He's about six or seven. So we had to lift this up because of the pressure on the brain. Then we have the kids who come in with uh, an ischemic insult. You know, they, they haven't, they're found not breathing at the scene. Or they've dislocated their head from their neck not on the outside, they're not decapitated, but they've pulled their um, head off their spine, particularly in little kids who have heavy heads and small bodies, and they, they essentially injure their brainstem and they can't breathe, and they're found in the field not breathing. This is a classic CT scan. The cerebellum tolerates ischemia pretty well, but the breast of the brain you can see is black, and the brainstem is black. This kid's got no oxygen. This kid will do terribly if they survive at all. Um, diffuse axonal injuries are kids that usually have a, an acceleration, deceleration injury. You know, they're traveling really fast in a car and they stop and the head comes forward and they shear their brain like you shear a bunch of spaghetti. And uh, the CAT scan looks fine, but you see all these little black dots. These are all small hemorrhages in the brain. They, they get over this actually quite well. These are the kids that come in comatose and the ICU asks us for an ICP monitor because Typically, we put ICP monitors in children we can't examine. You don't have a reliable exam. And an ICP monitor will tell you what their pressure is. And if it's high, you can treat it. And if it's low, you don't have to worry about it. You know, we get asked to put an ICP monitor in a kid like, like this, whose brain on a CT scan otherwise looks normal. We're a little reluctant to do it because there's no evidence for pressure. Sometimes we succumb. We put in the monitor, and their pressures are normal. The reason they're not waking up is because they have these shears in their white matter particularly down in the brainstem. If you have a shear injury in the midbrain, you may never wake up. Normal looking scan otherwise. If you can't help those kids, mannitol and 
treatment for ICP does nothing because it's not an ICP issue. Um, so uh, non-accidental injury, we need to talk about that briefly. Incidentally, when I'm giving this talk in, um, in person, I'm usually asking questions and getting questions asked. So I just looked down at my clock, it's 8.32. So I'm going through this much faster than I would if I was doing it uh, live. So if I finish early, I, I apologize to Cindy. Um, uh, but it's, it's my usual talk and I'll, I'm, hopefully you guys will have some questions to, to burn some time as well. But anyway, non-accidental trauma. Um, you know, this, this number I, I think is about 1.9% now. I just haven't changed the slide. But up to 2 million kids in this country are abused every year. Um, you will see these children, unfortunately, um, in the ICU. Uh, you probably already know this, but it doesn't matter whether you live um, in a rural area or urban area, whether you um, are from a high uh, income household or not. Um, these kids can be injured anywhere. Uh, we have a very good um, a child protective services team who will come evaluate these children. And I would urge everybody, um, if you have a child that you're concerned about, just call them. You may anger the parents, they may be offended, they may, but that doesn't matter. We don't see all of these children in this area. The reason we don't see them is because sometimes they're dead and they never come to the hospital. The reason that we are pretty uptight about when we see a kid who may have uh, a little bit of blood in their head or a fracture that's inexplicable, you know, um, baby looked fine, I don't know how this happened, or baby was with babysitter, or, um, you know, my one-year-old picked up my two-month-old and dropped them, well, that's just not going to happen. Or you get stories that change every three seconds, those are very concerning. Um, the reason that we get uptight about that is because if this kid, if a kid has had an injury at home or in somebody else's care and we let them go without investigating, you may not see them the next time. The coroner in DC has this entire talk. I don't know if you've seen it. They have this entire talk about the, the children that they see in the morgue who never come to the hospital because they, they're dead um, before they get here. So that's what we're trying to prevent, a kid who could potentially be protected and get into somebody else's care. So a lot of the injuries we see obviously have to do with the brain. That's why it's called shaken baby syndrome. Um, these kids are shaken and the brain sort of, you know, shakes around inside the head and they tear veins. They oftentimes come with subdurals. If they've been hit, um, they might have a hemorrhage in the brain. Skull fractures are, unfortunately, um, you've probably heard about these kids that are either hit with a fist or they're held by their legs and they're slammed up against the wall. Um, oftentimes they'll have extremity fractures and retinal hemorrhage is a pretty good way to make the diagnosis. There's very few things that are called, cause retinal hemorrhage. Um, in my opinion, the only thing that causes retinal hemorrhage is repetitive shaking or uh, cardiopulmonary, you know, CPR. CPR has been shown to cause retinal hemorrhages. But there's, there are people in this country and elsewhere in the world, um, so-called so experts who will testify that shaken baby uh, syndrome is not as prevalent and these kids can have these injuries from, for other reasons. They're usually um, testifying for the defense in a case against somebody. Um, and these kids can develop hydrocephalus, post-traumatic hydrocephalus, which only adds to their problems in life. So this, is a, so this is an MRI. This is a coronal image. We're looking straight at this kid. Um, top of the head, right side, left side. So this is the brain. These are the ventricles. The ventricles look sad, right? The ventricles should be up here. But you see all of this fluid. This kid's head is gigantic. And the brain is, you know, uh, two thirds the size of the inside of the head. Well. Upon initial evaluation, you might say, this is white, and we know this is ventricle, so that's spinal fluid. So this must be spinal fluid. Maybe this kid just has a big head, one of these, we call it benign enlargement subarachnoid phases of infancy. Normal kids, big heads, a lot of CSF, you leave them alone, it all goes away. 
Well, if you look very closely, this line right here is the arachnoid. So this here is benign enlargement of the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid, underneath the arachnoid. This is under the dura. The dura is out here, the arachnoid is here. So this is all chronic blood. Huge, huge hemorrhages, gigantic hemorrhages. So it turns out that this kid, so in, in just in popular culture and from what we've seen, most common people to injure a kid, mom's boyfriend, babysitter, sibling, dad, mom. Mom's the least likely. So it turns out that this kid was actually injured by her mom, which is quite rare, but she was. Incidentally, uh, in most states, you cannot prosecute somebody without either a confession or a witness. It's very hard, unfortunately. You can take the kid out of the house, but it's very hard to prosecute somebody. This is the axial image of the same kid, all this blood, even in the posterior fossa around the cerebellum, we don't see that very often. This unfortunate little girl, so I, I would ask you if you, we were in person, whether this is uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, a subdural or an epidural. Well, it's a subdural. You know that because it's covering a very large area. There's a tremendous amount. Of, it doesn't look very thick, right? It's only like a centimeter thick here. But the amount of shift from right to left is like two centimeters. This kid's ventricles are on the side, the side of her head. This kid was shaken. Um, she's really sick. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you that she came to the hospital um, with normal temperature, fixed and dilated pupils. So again, if you recall the brainstem reflexes, pupillary response, movement to pain, spontaneous breathing, gagging, eye movements when you move the head, that's called an oculocephalic reflex, an oculo um, vestibular reflex. You put cold water in the ear, it's very uncomfortable, but if you do that, it numbs the sensation for the, for, for the vestibular nerve and the eyes will start to drift. So this kid, those are all the brainstem reflexes. When you do a brain, brain death exam on somebody, if they have absent reflexes in all those categories with a normal temperature, they are by definition, by examination, the brain dead. So this kid had no brainstem reflexes, except when you put cold water in her ear, her eye moved just a little bit. This kid, in, in an adult patient, 100% mortality. In a kid, 98% mortality. And fortunately or unfortunately, we saved her. We took out her subdural. We knew that her brain was going to swell. So um, we left an ICP monitor in, but at, at surgery, her brain was not swelling so much. So I left the bone in. Oftentimes, you'll leave the bone out. Here's her ICP monitor. And you can see the air here. So her, even postoperatively, her brain looked pretty good. But if you sit back and you look at this picture, you see this little star and this stuff? This is, these are the white matter tracks in the brain. Even on a CAT scan, you can tell the difference between gray matter and white matter. On this side, you can't see it very well. You've lost the gray-white differentiation, and that's a bad sign. That would imply that there's maybe a stroke on this side. So her ICP skyrocketed, the air outside her brain went away, and her ventricles have shifted over, and her brain over here looks black. So it turns out that the person that injured this kid, you know, they hold him for their neck usually. Sometimes, if you imagine adult hands, adult arms on this kid's neck, um, the the vessels in the neck are pretty sensitive, and they injured this kid in addition to giving this kid a subdural from shaking her, they injured the carotid. This kid had a big carotid artery stroke. So she went back to surgery and we took out her skull to allow her brain to swell out. You can see pretty normal looking, nooks and crannies, white matter, gray matter here, just black. Black, no nooks and crannies, brain swelling out. Well, she eventually survived. This is what happened to her brain. It just atrophied. You can see this side of the brain looks pretty normal. This side of the brain looks pretty horrible. And we, we had put her skull in a freezer. 
That's what we typically do. If we remove a piece of bone, we put it in the freezer where it stays safe. And then if they survive, we go put the bone back. We have problems with that sometimes, but they do pretty well. This is a retinal hemorrhage, not a retinal hemorrhage, like you know, 20 retinal hemorrhages. So this is the fundus. This is the optic. If you look in the back of the eye through the, through the um, pupil you do, and you look at the fundus, you can see all of this blood in this kid's retina. Same kid, by the way, that I just showed you. This is her, these are her, her retinal hemorrhages. And then this is always sad, right? You see, these, these are baby x-rays, broken femur, broken humerus. Broken ribs are very common because they get squeezed here or somebody punches them. Usually they get squeezed, they get held really hard. And you'll see these kids come in with bruising, you know, cigarette burns, people put cigarettes out on them. Um, you see sometimes these burns that look like stockings on the legs because they've dipped them into really hot water. I can tell you, I mean, you don't need to hear anymore, but things even worse, terrible, terrible things that people do to these, these poor children. Um, so I told you there's some people that say that not all of this subdural blood and allegedly shaken kids is from being shaken. It could be from something else. I showed you that kid with all that, with what looked like water outside her brain, but it was blood. Well, a lot of normal kids have big heads with a lot of CSF, and people will argue that these otherwise normal kids, you know, here's all these veins that go from the brain to the superior sagittal sinus, to this big vein that goes down the middle of the head. You might imagine, these, they will argue, that if the subarachnoid space is big and these kids like sit, sit down really hard, sit on their butt really hard, maybe the brain pulls away a little bit and they tear a vein and they get a subdural. Yeah, I think that's possible. I think it's very unlikely. I think it's possible. So if you see a kid with a subdural in nothing else, no retinal hemorrhages, no fractures, unless somebody admits to something or there's something fishy going on, it's going to be hard ultimately to take that kid out of that house. If there's anything else, any other concomitant injury, the kid's been shaken, in my opinion. Um, the, you know, we see a lot of bad stuff, but the shaken baby, the non-accidental traumas is some of the worst stuff that we see. Really, it's, it's heart-wrenching. Um, this is a kid who um, comes in. So this is a CAT scan of a kid who you might think has benign enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces, ventricles, brain, and a little more black stuff, remember spinal fluid on a CAT scan is black, over their brain than you'd think. But when she got an MRI, you can see that this is spinal fluid, but this, which is a little bit more gray in color and is outside the arachnoid, is actually blood. So this was a subdural hematoma, but the parents were, she had no other injuries. Uh, one dad, the dad was an attorney, the mom was an engineer. They were investigated. They were, um, people came to their house. These people were very angry that somebody would even think that somebody may have injured their daughter. Um, <clears throat> the, mom, the kid stayed with the parents. She came back to see me. She had this. So this is definitely blood. It's definitely more new than what we saw on the MRI, which was old blood. So the um, this is in Northern Virginia. The county asked me for my uh, letter from the clinic. They saw what I wrote. They reinvestigated this family again for a second time. Um, and again, the workup was negative. The kids stayed with the family. We didn't have an, a, a, a reason for this to have happened. This is a subsequent CT scan that blood went away. So I don't have an answer for why everything happens. And sometimes even the CP, I'm sure there's people that fly underneath the radar. There's probably people who get away with injuring these kids. I'm not casting aspersions of this family, but sometimes we don't have an answer for why something happened. Um, so we need to recognize this, as I mentioned. Um, sometimes these kids will not make it back to the hospital. Um, uh, the, I usually end the talk by talking about uh, non-accidental trauma, and I'm, I'm sorry for that, but it's, it's the 
the kid who was in a car accident and has a subdural, you know what happened to that kid. The kid who, um, you know, a tree falls on their head and crushes their skull, you know what happened to that kid. These kids, when you don't have a clear history, you don't know what happened to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the onus is on us to try to figure it out. Uh, we're kind to the families, we're respectful of the families, but we need to make them understand that we're doing this to make sure that everybody's safe. So anyway, that's the gist of my talk. Um, it's 8.47, I stopped a little bit early, again, forgive me, but let me know if you have any questions. And I can back up into my slides and, and um, go over anything you like. I have a quick question, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, I actually had a patient a couple weeks ago in the ICE, in the PICU. Um, it was like a four month old boy, I'm not sure if you had him, but he came in with like multiple subdural hematomas and like they checked his eyes and a lot of retinal hemorrhages. So it was like obviously worked up as an NAT, but mom had like Von Willebrands. And so they were testing the baby for Von Willebrands as well. And like the neuro, the neurosurge like doctor and like the picky, they were like kind of debating in rounds, like without the parents present, of course, like if the Von Willebrands could have caused like that significant of like subdural hematomas and retinal hemorrhages. And like, they never really came to a conclusion. I don't know if you guys ended up figuring it out. So uh, I, he wasn't my kid, I, but I do recall um, that story. So that's tough, right? Um, part of the workup in any kid who comes in with a non, uh, you know, inexplicable hemorrhage is a coagulopathy workup, and oftentimes hematology gets involved. So von Willebrand's, for everybody who doesn't know, is you know a, a coagulopathic. Uh, I think it's factor eight or factor nine deficiency. So these kids bleed easily. I, you know, in my in my opinion, I don't think that. Um, the Avon Wildrand's kid would have a retinal hemorrhage without trauma. So I think the Avon Wildrand's just makes him more likely to have a big hemorrhage. Um, but in, unfortunately, in a court of law, all you have to do is throw in one confounding factor, oh, the kid has a coagulopathy, and all bets are off. It's going to be very hard to argue against that. So I don't know what, what came of that. Um, uh, that's certainly a difficult situation. Uh, I, I, I think that um, my own, um, you know, I, as a neurosurgeon, I have no say. All, all we can really do is take care of the kid. But I would, because of the retinal hemorrhage, I'd be terribly suspicious that somebody injured this kid regardless. Uh, and it's not because I don't trust people. It's just because, you know, when you've been doing this long enough and it's the reason you guys went into pediatric care, we're so um, – overprotective, not even overprotective. We're just so concerned about these children's welfare. We'll do anything, including piss people off to keep them safe. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. Anything else, any other questions? Um, there's a couple questions on the chat. I'm just gonna read them verbatim for you. Okay. Um, Michelle Stevenson asks, what is considered a normal ICP level? Uh, so, you know, let, I'm sorry I didn't discuss ICPs, monitoring and and treatment for increased intracranial pressure much, it would make the talk even a lot longer. So, so traditionally, and again, this is based actually on adult work, but traditionally, uh, uh, having, so a normal ICP in you and I, me sitting in my chair right now, my ICP is probably about four. If you lie down around 10, if you sleep, maybe 12, 13, because when we sleep, we hypoventilate, we retain some carbon dioxide, we're lying down, the venous outflow from our brain isn't so good, so our ICP goes up a little bit. That's why children who have posterior fossa tumors and hydrocephalus, the classic presentation is morning vomiting because they've been lying down, hypoventilating all night, blood staying in their head, their hydrocephalus gets a little worse. By morning time, their ICP is maxed out, they puke, they get up, they start breathing normally, venous return improves and their symptoms go away. But sitting still or standing up, your ICP should be quite low, even in a kid, two, two to four. Lying down, maybe 10. But what we tolerate for an ICP in a head injury is up to 20, right? Sustained ICPs above 20 traditionally is what's bad. 20 is really high. If I gave you an ICP of 20, it'd probably put you in a coma, frankly, if not a wicked headache. So people have started moving away from ICPs and really paying more attention to CPPs, to cerebral perfusion pressures. What matters in the end is how much pressure, is, is how much blood you're getting to your brain. ICP is bad 
because your blood pressure is working against it to deliver to deliver oxygen to your brain, right? I mean, if your intracranial pressure is 20 and your mean arterial pressure is 40, that's not a lot of blood. If your mean arterial pressure is 100 and your ICP is 20, your cerebral perfusion pressure is 80. That's pretty good. So ICP is probably not a great, great way to follow kids. We do it. It's sort of the standard of what we do, but cerebral perfusion pressure is better. Cerebral perfusion pressure is what's good and what's bad is not very clear. Adults definitely need a higher cerebral perfusion pressure, 60, 70, and above. But kids can probably get away with a 40, cerebral perfusion pressure of 40. And the younger they are, the more likely it is that works. The older they get, the closer you need to get to 60. So we usually treat intracranial pressures above 20. Um, I, we do it more from tradition and old data than from anything new. But to answer you, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing and babbling on. Uh, the, an ICP of less than 20 is what we strive for. Okay, and I, I have one more question um, that's in the chat. Um, what is the treatment process for DAIs? For DAI? Yes. Unfortunately, nothing. Um, if, you know, you almost wish that there was an ICP problem that you could treat. But if indeed we put an ICP monitor, and ultimately that comes down to the neurosurgery attending and the, and the resident to see whether they want to do, they want to put an ICP monitor, because it goes, Nowadays, we get MRIs fairly readily. If we have a CT that looks normal, before we put an ICP monitor, we say get an MRI. If we get an MRI and there's clearly a shear injury, but the basal cistern draw patent, we won't put in an ICP monitor. If there's a question, we'll put in the ICP monitor. If the ICP is low, there's nothing you can do. If there's no ICP monitor in, there's nothing you can do. I don't mean to sound so nihilistic, like your, your hands are tied, but they are. Shear injuries are a matter of time. Physical therapy and occupational therapy and rehab are probably as helpful as anything. There are no magic drugs. Steroids don't help. Anticonvulsives don't help. Only time. Um, those are the um, the last questions on the chat. Um, but I have I have one personally that I think that would be really beneficial for everybody on the call. Um, if um, as a new nurse and they're concerned about their patient's neurostatus, regardless of what floor they're on, uh, what would you suggest to them to do before calling for help? Before they call for help? Yes. So uh, it all goes back to actually basic um, life support, trauma, ABCs. Make sure that the kid's oxygenating okay before you leave the patient, right? Before you pick up a phone or you leave the room. Make sure that the kid is oxygenating okay, has a good blood pressure and a heart rate. Because if they don't, that time that you're calling somebody or, or getting, you know, trying to get somebody's attention or going out to, is time lost. If they're oxygenating okay and their heart rate and their blood pressure are okay, if their airway is secure, make the call. Don't give them mannitol. Very quick and easy things you can do. If you really think, if you've made the assessment that this kid's got an ICP problem and they're flat in bed, at least put their head up. That's one thing you can do. If their oxygen's a little low, maybe put some oxygen on the nose if they're not intubated and then get, get help. What I thought you were going to ask me, Cindy, is what happens if this is the scenario and nobody's answering or somebody's blowing you off or the PICU resident says call the fellow and the fellow is intubating somebody, or you just can't get an answer. <clears throat> or you've called the neurosurgery resident or PA, they wouldn't do this, but they said, I just saw the kid, they're fine. They dismiss you for whatever reason. Worst comes to worse, you always follow the chain of command. Call the PICU attending. The PICU attending is, you know, having a seizure, call the neurosurgery attendant. I am not telling you call the neurosurgery attending for head injuries. But if you have, if you're at the end of your rope and you have nothing, call us. We might be annoyed, whatever, doesn't matter. All that stuff is not important. All that's important is your, is your patient, your little kid's welfare. So ABCs, get help, head of that up. That's a, a quick and easy thing to do. Don't, you know, if they're, 
if they're intubated and you think they're getting into trouble and they've dilated a pupil and their CO2 is 40, yeah, you, you can, you know, bag them down, do something, you can give them, do, do the quick and easy stuff. But I wouldn't start giving mannitol, giving 3%, cooling them, taking it for a CAT scan without talking to somebody first. Not that you're making the wrong call, you just need help. You, I literally need more people.